Hello. In this video, I want to explain how you can perform molecular dynamics simulations using a piece of software called the Atomistic Simulation Environment. Before we get to that, however, let's just summarize what we have done using molecular dynamics in previous exercises. In the second assignment for this module, you learn to generate a trajectory like the one that the red ball is traveling along in this video. In other words, you learned how we can determine how the position of a particle changes with time when that particle is sat on an energy landscape. In your simulations, the particle was the potential was a function of a single variable x. No one would really use molecular dynamics to study such a system in any realistic application that might appear in an academic journal article. In academic journal articles, molecular dynamics is used to study systems like the one shown here. The red spheres in this image represent the atoms that the system is composed of. Each of these atoms is located at a position in three-dimensional space. When we are doing molecular dynamics, we are thus generating a trajectory that tells us how the 3n atomic positions change with time, n in this case being the number of atoms. Our potential V of R in these sorts of calculations is usually a pair potential. This pair potential is a function of the distances between pairs of atoms. We thus have to calculate the pairwise distance between all the atoms. That is, n multiplied by n minus 1 over two distances. For each of these distances, we have to compute V of R, and then we have to add all of these pairwise values together in order to calculate the potential energy. This calculation is expensive. As you should have seen by completing the first few exercises for this week, writing a program to calculate a pair potential and the forces due to that pair potential is not very difficult. If you know how to do that and the code for the velocity Verlet algorithm and Langevin thermostat that you studied in the second of these assignments, it is not very difficult to write an MD code to look at multiparticle systems. You basically have all the pieces you need to write a such a code. Writing your own MD code is a bad idea, however, for two reasons. The first of these is that people use a wide variety of different expressions for V of R. Implementing all the potentials that are used in the, last, in the literature is thus an enormous amount of work. More important, however, is the fact that MD calculations, particularly for large systems, are computationally expensive. We thus have to use some of the most powerful computers in the world to run research level calculations. Writing fast code that works on these machines takes a long time and is not something that you can do in a three year PhD. Consequently, from this point on in the course, I am going to teach you how to use someone else's MD code rather than getting you to write code from scratch. The code we will be using is called Atomistic Simulation Environment, or ASE for short. At this stage, it is useful to look again at the MD code we wrote for Assignment 2, as we, as we are starting out on this journey of how to use ASE. Here is the code for NVAT Dynamics that we wrote for that assignment once more. We can break this code down into some initialization stuff outside the loop, which is followed by the loop that generates our molecular dynamics trajectory. Now, the first thing to note about doing this type of calculation with ASE is that ASE is going to look after all the trajectory stuff. In other words, the part that I have covered here of the code from assignment two is going to be looked after to, by ASE. So we don't need to worry about implementing any of that anymore. What we are left to do is implement the code shown at the top of the slide. Now the first three lines in this code just set some simulation variables. The fourth line here is important for the MD, so we need to recall what is being done here and learn how to complete these tasks using ASE. 
The first task achieved on line 4 is that we give the atoms their initial position. Finding a reasonable initial structure to use in an MD simulation is difficult. Typically, experimental data would be used to provide the initial structure. Alternatively, you might start off with atoms in random initial positions. There is a lot to this though, and a large portion of a PhD might be concerned with finding an, a reasonable initial configuration to start a simulation from. In this module, however, we're going to make things simple and start off with the atoms on the lattice positions of a face-centered cubic crystal. There is an ASE command that we can use to create this initial position. This ASE command is shown here. This command puts the atomic atoms on the lattice sites of the FCC crystal. In your codes, you are pretty much going to copy this line verbatim. You may, however, need to adjust the lattice parameter when you are completing your own assignment, however. The second line of code that I have written here sets the masses of the atoms. I have set all the masses of the atoms equal to 1 here, which you should also do. It is worth thinking about the structure of this command, however, as we are going to use some of the object-oriented features in the Python programming language, which, I ha which we haven't done before. What you need to recognize is that the variable atoms is not simply a vector that contains all the atomic positions, as you might have thought from that first command. Instead, it is a special type of object that is designed within the ASC code and it is designed to hold a lot of information about the atoms. In other words, the positions, forces, masses, and many other properties of the atoms are all contained within this object called atoms. There are then methods like the set masses method that we have used here that are also part of the atoms object. We use these methods to set the properties of the atoms. In the atoms method, there are also methods that we use for extracting these various properties. An important part of learning how to use ASE is thus understanding how to send and get information from the atoms object, as we are starting to do here. Let's now return to the MD code that we wrote in assignment 2 and talk about what we did after we set the initial position. After we set the initial position of the particle, we set its initial velocity. This initial velocity was a single random number. For our n particle system, we need to generate three n random numbers, three random initial velocities for each atom, a velocity in the x, y, and z directions. We can do this with ASE by using the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution command as shown here. Notice that we pass this uh, function two arguments. The first is the atoms object that we generated when we set the initial positions. The second is then the temperature that we want that we are planning to do our simulation at. We have now generated an initial microstate that we can perform dynamic starting from. To do the dynamics, however, we need to tell ASE how to calculate the potential and the forces that act upon the atom. This is the part of the code where ASE offers an enormous amount of flexibility. We are not going to explore that flexibility here and are instead going to use a calculator that I wrote for you, which is called pairwise calculator. To invoke this method of calculating the energy and forces, you use the pairwise calculator command as shown here. You can actually look at the code of the pairwise calculator by looking at the pairwise calculator.py file that I've included in the REPL exercises. When it comes to completing your assignment, 
you will also need to copy the code from that file into your notebooks in order to get your calculations to work. Notice that this line of code tells ASE how to calculate the potential and forces and uses the atoms object again. In particular, the command here sets the calc method of atoms so that when this method is called, the pairwise calculator is used. The pairwise calculator itself takes two inputs. The first of these, RC, is a cutoff, which I have set equal to 4 in this command. When you set a cutoff like this, you are essentially saying that the pair potential can be assumed to be 0 for all r greater than this value. For the Leonard Jones system that you are looking at in the exercise, you can safely set this cutoff equal to 4. When you are running simulations with different potentials, however, please do not uncritically use 4. You should instead plot your potential and identify a sensible value for RC by looking at where your function goes to 0. The other argument to this function is the name of a Python function that ASE can use to calculate your pairwise potential. I'm going to talk about this function in much greater depth on the next slide as it is a little bit complicated. I am just going to pass over this for now as we have initial positions and velocities and a potential and we are ready to do some molecular dynamics with ASC. To do so, we just use the two commands shown here. Notice that the command Langevin takes the atoms object once more. The other three arguments are then the time step, the thermos, the temperature, and the thermostat friction that we had to set at the start of our code to do 1D constant temperature MD. By calling the run method of DIN, we can then run molecular dynamics. This method takes one argument, which is the number of steps of dynamics we would like to do. Notice furthermore that we can call din.run multiple times. The second time this method is called, it will restart the simulation from the microstate that the system arrived at at the end of the previous bunch of dynamics. I hope you agree that writing these two lines of code is much easier than writing an MD a piece of MD software from scratch. Okay, now that we have established how to run molecular dynamics with ASC, let's provide that promised detail on the FFF function that is used to calculate the pair potential. In other words, let's clarify what is going on with the command shown at the top of this slide. To explain what I'm doing here, I'm going to get you to consider the Leonard Jones potential, which has the functional form shown here. This fun potential is a function of the distance between the pairs of atoms, which we can calculate from the positions of atoms by using Pythagoras' theorem, as shown here. Now recall that the forces are obtained by taking the negative derivative of the potential with respect to the atomic positions. In other words, we have to differentiate with respect to the quantities that appear in, in the expression for R and not with respect to R itself. To calculate these forces, we can exploit the chain rule as shown here. In other words, we calculate the derivative of the potential with respect to r and then multiply that derivative by the derivative of the distance with respect to the position. The derivative of r with respect to xi is easy to compute and is given by the expression shown here. It is also easy to show that the derivative of v with respect to r is given by the expression shown here. 
I mention all this so that you can make sense of the function FFF that I am passing to ASE here. This function is used by ASE to calculate the pair potential. Notice that this line that sets the variable e, which is then returned from the function, is basically calculating the v of r that I have defined above. The next line starts the calculation of the force that acts on the pairwise distance. This line starts with a minus sign because we are calculating a force. You need to be careful when doing this part and ensure your forces have the correct sign. The code here is correct, even though it might not appear so based on the equations I have written. This is a consequence of the way that things are implemented in the pairwise calculator class. What follows the minus sign here is the derivative of v with respect to r. Notice, however, that we are dividing by the square of the distance between the points here rather than the distance we would rather than the distance. We would be dividing by the distance if we had implemented a pure version of the formula shown at the bottom of the slide. The reason there is an additional 1 over r term comes from the derivative of r with respect to xj. The xi minus xj term that appears in the derivative are looked after by ASC. I wanted you to recognize, however, that we have to use the chain rule when we calculate the force due to a pair potential. This is why the f term you return here must be 1 over r times dv by dr minus that rather than simply dv by dr. And that is it. I hope that's enough to get you going. Try the exercise now to see if you can run MD with ASE. Good luck and thanks for your attention as always.